Hey colleagues, greetings and welcome back. Long time no see. Hisashi Buri yes. Um, or I should say actually, Merhaba, Ie Gunlar from the beautiful thousand year city of Istanbul, formerly Constantinople and Byzantium. So, what do I want to do on this uh, beautiful, bright and cool autumn day? Let's talk about philosophy. Let, let, more specifically, let's talk about the practical value of philosophy for life. In some respect, kind of the most important question that I guess a philosopher can ask, and according to the philosophers, the most important question that a human being can ask. Before we do, though, let's take a moment, as usual, again, in this uh, wonderful apartment, uh, a new place, uh, Shiranai Tenjo, as uh, Ikari Kendo would put it. Shinji, Ikari Shinji. Uh, so we have our old, fri- our old friend, the Buddha, with us, uh, uh, reminding us to try to be mindful, to try to maintain mindfulness at all times. And I do feel that there's a deep connection between proper mindfulness, yoga, and philosophy. Hopefully, we'll talk about this in a second. Before we do, let's let's just do a little attunement. The large singing bowl, unfortunately, was a bit too big to carry, but, you know, um, it's not the size of the bowl that counts, but the depth of mindfulness. Um, so, let me start somewhere. It is early September, and usually at this time I would be, unfortunately, very unmindful. I would be uh, uh, very much buried in work, bureaucratic work especially, because of the beginning of the semester. But this year, um, thanks to the... (laughs) Due to the supreme will of Zeus, of Jupiter, I find myself far from teaching duties again in a beautiful yet foreign city of Istanbul. Um, I cannot say that... Mm, I regret not being in classroom. Uh, uh, in an important respect, those of you who know me will remember usually in September I, I have this lament. I talk about how over the summer months I have a chance to build up the mindfulness and the calmness. And then as the semester begins, again, this uh, capitalist performance principle, because one way or another, I mean, universities, most universities are capitalist institutions, definitely the university I used to teach in, formerly still am a part of, though not teaching any classes this semester, at least uh, uh, no classes uh, in in the university, in the formal university setting. We'll see, we'll see maybe, uh, maybe on the channel. Um, we'll do more of these. Um, Videos. Actually, uh, I would have preferred to do this as a live stream. Uh, lamentably, this is the <laughs> the peculiarities of moving. My internet here does not really support live streams. But uh, uh, if you're watching this, it means that at least I've been able to locate a decent enough you know access point to <laughs> to upload a video. Um. Anyway, small talk. Let's cut the small talk. Let me, let me try to reflect on my experiences. And again, I've been teaching philosophy for more than 10 years now. And um, to some extent, what I want to do this year, like all sorts of things I want to do, but one of the things is I want to reflect on my um, experience as a teacher, on my career as a teacher. Career, vocation. And um, so whenever I come, you know, around this time to a classroom. I'm always reminded of myself. Um, I did not major in philosophy. So, you know, my, my, my first degree, my bachelor's degree is actually in economics. 
economics and management. Uh, and again, there's um, talk about capitalism. It's hard not to talk about capitalism from the very beginning, right? Who has decided that I'm going to specialize, that I'm going to major in economics and management? Not me and not my parents. It was the uh, quote-unquote free market, yeah, the, the forces, the forces of the market. Also, not not the Hegelian Rechtsstaat. So it's not the government. Yeah, it is it is the market forces that decide that tell you what you are going to be. Again, Marx is going to talk about how human beings have these universal propensities, and yet it is the market that decides what you're going to do. And um, actually, you know, I've been teaching uh, um, mostly in three departments, uh, Department of Computer Science, of International Relations, and of, of Economics. And uh, in all three departments, I would teach first, second, and third year students. Um, and a, a significant portion of the students that, that I've met were in a very similar situation to, to, to my own situation. Again, I did not major in philosophy. I started, you know, on this path towards economics, was not excited to pursue it at all. Uh, it ran counter to all sorts of things in my upbringing and my intuitions about what is good, uh, um, w what is a good and proper way to live a human life. Um, but, you know, as a child, you find yourself, well, I mean, 16 years old is not exactly a child, but, you know, you find yourself kind of hemmed in by external circumstances. And this is what I find to be true about a significant proportion of my uh, uh, students who don't care about the formal size of education. And again, the educational system is very much built into this instrumental logic, this logic of efficiency for the sake of efficiency. Again, these earthly, secular notions of success that are imposed on us to a large extent by the capitalist system. Uh, that we are kind of the capitalist system produces a certain kind of... Um, hierarchy and we are supposed to slot into that hierarchy it's kind of again people talk about this uh, uh, communist individualism versus capitalist collectivism uh, uh, capitalism the kind of system that it is requires differently abled people to slot into the same categories and all do the same thing whereas presumably hopefully somehow on the other side and again i mentioned marx and i mentioned communism but it, this doesn't have to be about marx or about communism this could be about the Buddha, or this could be about Socrates or Plato. Uh, uh, yeah, so Aristotle would talk, or I mean, so uh, Plato, um, in his dialogues, describes philosophy as schole, schole, something that free people do in their spare time, uh, in their leisure time. Schole in Greek means leisure, right? And uh, um, you know, this this notion of a liberal education, liberal education, uh, as opposed to a vocational training. So a liberal education is. An education that can be, you know, that and that a free person can afford because they are free. And also an education which is supposed to teach you, or, or, no, I don't want to say teach, it's supposed to de help you develop your abilities as a free person. Um, supposed to make your freedom more meaningful, make you ideally a, ma a master of yourself. Again, one of the uh, pedagogical dialogues of Plato, sometimes... I think in Byzantium it was customary to begin the study of Plato with this dialogue, the dialogue Alcibiades, where uh, Socrates talks to Alcibiades, it's also one of the favorite dialogues of Foucault, um, where um, Socrates tells to Alcibiades that before, because what does Alcibiades aspire to? He aspires to rule the world. He aspires to be a successful politician, or at least to rule Athens, right? And, uh, you know, as a, as a joke or as a half joke, of course, many of the first year students I talk to at least, you know, rhetorically would say, yeah, you know, when I grow up, I want to be the king of the world or, or the queen of the world, the president of the world, right? And so this is what Alcibiades wants as well. And Socrates tells him, before you dominate others, before you master others, before you become the master over others, you first need to know how to be a master of yourself, right? And with respect to this, mm, there's several points I want to make. So one is that, again, there's this notion that when we are born, we are not born masters of ourselves. We, we are not born already proficient at life. But on the other hand, again, like on the contrary, as somebody like Heidegger might have put it, we are thrown into this world without a manual. We do not know what we are. Again, uh, Kant says that many important questions in philosophy, the most important question of philosophy is, was ist der Mensch? What is a human being? Understanding what you are 
and and from there understanding what you should do and you know what can you what does the future hold uh, um, what is a proper what is a good way to live your life in an important respect maybe the most important question the most important question that a you know reflecting human being is capable of asking and um it is an important question to some extent immediately you can see it's a, it is a dangerous question again Reminder, Socrates was uh, brought up on charges of treason and of corruption of, of the youth. And uh, um, to some extent, I think that those charges were justified. Because when you put it this way, when you say that human beings are not necessarily uh, proficient at life, that you are not necessarily born already equipped in the best possible fashion to live an excellent life. Again, the Greeks had this notion of arete. This is, to some extent, politically subversive. Because um, most societies, most societies that come to mind, mm, human, you know, human children in the process of socialization are supposed to imbibe certain norms and live according to them, right? And to, to, to even ask this question, are these norms given to me by my society, are these good norms? That's a dangerous question. That's a dangerous question and a potentially, potentially a subversive, a treasonous question. So kind of, if you want the government or the kind of the conservative forces that are trying to keep society together have, I feel, every reason to be skeptical of the philosophical enterprise, right? And then, um, I mean, even, you know, going back to the beginning of our discipline in the West, to somebody, like, again, like Socrates in, the, in Plato's dialogues, there's this notion that... Um, Human beings can, you know, really thrive in well-ordered societies. And so, like, ideally, ideally, if you find yourself in a well-ordered society, that's, that's wonderful, that's beautiful, you, you, you're lucky, you can just follow uh, the, laws of your, the laws and the norms and the customs of your society. And so, kind of, on this one pole, let, let's say on, the, on this side, we're going to have this maximum harmony, maximum consensus, that this, this is a society which we want to be a part of. But then on the other pole, there's this lurking danger, there's this nagging doubt that maybe my society is lying to me. And I feel many children and many young people have this, have this notion, have this suspicion that maybe what my parents tell me, maybe what my society tells me is actually a lie, an ideological misrepresentation of reality that is only there to try to take advantage of me, to try to force me to do something against my will and against my interest. And so you have kind of have these two poles, the pole of conflict in which, you know, society is dominated by lies and exploitation and the pole of consensus in which, um, you know, ultimately to be, to be properly happy and properly human, you need to be a member of a society. And maybe we find ourselves somewhere in between of those two poles. This is something I talk uh, a lot about in my... Um, course, in my Coursera course, Introduction to Political Philosophy, um, in many ways this uh, notion, you know, finding yourself between conflict and consensus, this is one of the key aspects of the, of the entire course. And so, um, kind of trying to move forward in, in no particular order, um, I want to get to Freud, but before I, I, I get to Freud, let me let me say a word. So so values. We talk about values. Um, the word value is a is a very kind of charged word. People have strong feelings about values because people have values. Most people, you know, or oftentimes people feel very strongly about certain things, right? And um, this is one of the things that I feel philosophy requires. Again, this, this notion that going back to ancient past, going back to time immemorial, somebody like Socrates or somebody like the Buddha, right? Or in more modern times, yes, maybe Freud, Nietzsche definitely, uh, definitely uh, Marx. So Nietzsche, Freud, Marx, the three philosophers of suspicion, if you want. You can throw in my favorite, Michel Foucault. Right? So, so from this ancient tradition to the modern tradition, we have this we find this very critical element of the philosophical enterprise. Philosophy asks us to be critical of our values, to understand that, yes, I wake up in the morning and I find myself with beliefs, values, and desires, but my beliefs may be false, my desires may be misguided, and my values also could be somehow false, misconstrued, uh, you know, 
not corresponding to reality implanted into my brain by hostile forces, right? And in an important respect, this kind of way of talking about beliefs, values, and desires is just a way of making this notion of conflict and consensus more precise. In a perfectly conflictual societies, um, you know, in somebody like Hegel, for example, we find this beautiful picture how a child is born and they imbibe, they absorb the beliefs and the values and the, and the, and the desires of their society. Of course, human beings do have desires, but to some extent, to some extent, some limited extent, desires are constructed, uh, are implanted to us by, by our society. Society tells us uh, uh, what to like, what to, what to aspire to. It has a way of shaping the way, you know, channeling our desires in, in, in a particular direction. Not to mention that apparently, you know, if we, if we are to trust the psychologists, human desires in general have an, have an important social dimension. So, you know, in this ideal kind of harmonious society, children absorb these beliefs, values, and desires from their environment, then they grow up and they go through some form of a rebellious stage where they critically examine these beliefs, values, and desires and come to reaffirm them, right? This is Hegelian, the Hegelian formula. Was vernünftig ist, das ist wirklich, und was wirklich ist, das ist vernünftig. Yes? What is real is rational, and what is rational is real. You don't know that as a child. You just accept it on, on faith. You trust your parents and your immediate uh, social environment. But then as you grow up, you, you can verify uh, the rationality of the laws and customs of your society, and you, you, you harmonize yourself with your society, and you become a productive member. This is the picture of harmony. Again, in somebody like, in somebody like Aristotle or in somebody like Hegel. Yeah, but on the other hand, on the other pole, um, again, Nietzsche, Freud, Marx, Foucault, Socrates often talks about this as well. Uh, maybe you find yourself in a society, and again, I, I, let's, let's, let, this is the beauty of, of, uh, of doing philosophy. Let's take a step back. We're not necessarily talking about your society or my society. I mean, I find myself in Turkey right now, in the beautiful city of Istanbul. Right? So let's, let's bracket this out. Let's, let's ask this as a general question. For any particular person, the society in which you find yourself, is it more conflictual? Is, is it more consensual? Right? And in terms of the conflict, yes, beliefs, values, and desires but beliefs, maybe, you know, think of, oh, there's always some kind of con uh, uncontroversial example. Think of the Middle Ages, some kind of, you know, feudal arrangements. Uh, there's a divine right of kings. We, we would say that this is, you know, false, false propaganda. It's a false belief, right? Then uh, um, false values, or at least false ways of, of channeling human values in, in, let's say, in those kinds of societies or, or, or elsewhere. And... Um, so it's like what I'm what I'm driving at is that philosophy is subversive, but it seems that there's no easy solution to this problem of philosophy being subversive, because you can never and you know many philosophers again Paul Ricoeur has this phrase philosophy of suspicion vis-à-vis -vis Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx, and Foucault talks about philosophy being this perpetually restless enterprise that as a philosopher you can never be satisfied because there's always this nagging doubt that maybe I'm wrong. And at the end of the day, you never find a solid piece of ground to stand on. There is no Archimedean point in philosophy. Uh, Descartes notwithstanding, it's a philosophical dream about apodictic truths, but at the end of the day, philosophy rests on nothing. It is this kind of dialogical enterprise. Mm. Dialogical and open-ended enterprise, and you have to kind of examine and re-examine your opinions, yes, and dialogue with others. That's a, an important topic, maybe, for another day. Um, but then, kind of to continue on from this, again, idea of beliefs, values, and desires, somebody like Freud, and it's, uh, um, you know, people have people have very polarized opinions on Freud. Um, some people like Freud, some people hate Freud. Uh, my, my own view is, is that I feel Freud should be taken seriously. Freud definitely has some very valuable insights, I feel, and, you know, I am, I'm, tempted, inclined always to speak of Freud in my first class, which is to some extent what I'm doing right now. This is not a class, but, you know, it's early September, so this this might as well be. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of reliving the flashbacks in my memory of uh, previous classes I've taught, right? And so um, Freud talks about this internal complexity. So immediately in Freud, you have this notion of human nature. That's another thing that in some circles is controversial, but I think uh, there is such a thing as human nature. I mean, I breathe air and... I don't die from it. I drink this clear liquid, which is water, and it's actually, it actually sustains my body. So there are certain um, 
constants of human nature, uh, which are not easy to pin down, right? And important to meditate on philosophers such as David Hume or Jean-Paul Sartre has this beautiful uh, passage from the nausea, imagining what would happen if the constancy of nature, of the nature around me, and of human nature, these constants might change tomorrow, for all we know. Again, the primary, one of the driving hypotheses between the philosophical enterprise is that human knowledge, human mind is limited, and we do not have access to truths with a capital T. So, kind of, I'm trying to say everything at the same time, but what I'm driving at is that there is such a thing as human nature, apparently, as far as we can tell, as far as we can see, as far as we can observe in our own experience, phenomenologically, if you want. But there is no, uh, but, but it's a problematic topic, and it's a problematic phrase, it's a problematic concept. Uh, the concept of human nature can be abused, uh, can be used for deleterious purposes, you know, as a, as a vehicle of power, um, but also the concept of nature, of human nature, might not necessarily be so easy to pin down, right? There were certain notions of human nature which existed in, uh, in ancient times, in antiquity, or in the Middle Ages, which we now find to be wrong. So, you know, one has to be careful when declaring something to be part of human nature. And yet, tentatively and hypothetically, I think we do have to proceed on the, on the idea that there is something to this notion of human nature. And the way that um, Freud describes human nature, again, in certain basic terms, is in, in these three parts. That there's the id, the ego, and the superego, right? The id would be this um, animal part, most closely associated with desires, um, natural desires, you know, today we would say biologically pre-programmed desires, uh, desire for, you know, um, nutritious food, desire for water, right, air, breathing air, of course, very importantly for Freud, sexual desire, which is always an interesting topic uh, to talk about in an uh, uh, interesting, problematic, nuanced topic to bring up in a classroom, especially talking to young people, but I feel a very important topic nonetheless, maybe not for this particular video, but for a future time, oh, thinking of Freud, thinking of Jacques Lacan. Freud would say that, of course, all, motiv all human motivation is ultimately sexual motivation, but that's, that's, a, that's a topic for another day. For another day. So, you know, we talk about the id, the quote-unquote animal part. There's then the ego, which, um, to really oversimplify, Freud associates with some kind of... Uh, uh, rational narrative self-consciousness on the surface, the way that we present ourselves biographically. Kind of uh, uh, superego is the one that carries out the verbal dialogue in, in, in your head, right, or in, in my head. So in an important respect, kind of, it, it, is, it is the ego that is speaking first and foremost. But the, e but the ego is constrained by the id. And the, the id, uh, kind of the, the ego has to negotiate what it does with with the id, right? And and then there's the superego, and the superego, very very sinister, uh, but also very necessary for Freud, um, is the voice of society within us, the voice of conscience to some extent, but kind of, again, the ideas, the beliefs, the values, and the desires that society implants into us, injects into our head. And for most, for most people, most of the time, um, the superego is invisible. We don't, we don't know, we don't understand that the superego comes from without and implants into our head. Most people, when they talk about their values, their values are actually not their values. Their values or their religion or their worldview mostly comes from their society, but they don't see it that way. They have this attachment, they feel kind of attachment to their identity. There's this lack of critical distance, right? And Freud is going to say it's sinister because it's open to abuses, and this is one of the ways in which society dominates us, represses us, makes us depressed, makes us suicidal, right? Breaks us, uh, uh, forces us to, 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 to do its bidding. Again, talking about this, uh, this uh, uh, anxiety in uh, Freud, in Marx, in Max Weber, in Emil Durkheim, that there's this lo social logic sui generis logic of efficiency for the sake of efficiency, which has not, which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with human well-being or happiness or flourishing, which, which, which exists in its own kind of register, kind of society as a force dominating the individuals. Again, a topic for another day. What, what is society? At the end of the day, yeah, society is some, some sort of emergent dynamic, dynamic which emerges from the interactions between individuals, but is not necessarily reducible to the, the individuals has, a, has an ontological status of its own, right? 
And so again, in Freud, we have this, the id, the ego, and the superego, loosely corresponding, although not exactly identical, to Plato's tripartite structure of the soul. The appetitive part of the soul, broadly speaking, id, the uh, spirited part of the soul, broadly speaking, superego, more associated in Plato for this desire for glory, desire for recognition, desire for honor, phumos in Greek, right? And then the rational part of the soul, which is not necessarily, you know, not necessarily ego, not identical to ego, because for Plato has this very clear connotation. It's a, uh, it's a very peculiar desire, desire to know, love for wisdom, philosophia, right? All sorts of connotations, potential connotations there. Um, Pythagoreans, I forget exactly the reference, maybe Diogenes Laertius, I could venture a guess, or Plutarch, some, somewhere, somewhere. Not sure, don't quote me on that. But the, the Pythagoreans uh, allegedly speak about how there are three kinds of people that come to, to the Olympic Games. The desiring folk, the merchants, the competitive folk, the athletes, and then the, contempl the contemplative folk, the people who come there to contemplate, to observe. And these are kind of the prototypical philosopher. Somebody who, you know, observes the world in a detached fashion. Although, again, in today's world, we would say that uh, being completely detached is impossible and your perception of the world is always colored by your nature, which is subjective, colored by your desires, which are subjective, and colored by your values, which are also subjective. So, not, you know, kind of not 100% detachment. Um, and... <laughs> Again, imagining myself talking to first-year students, this is this is this was this is my sales pitch for the philosophical enterprise. We find ourselves thrown into this world without a manual. We suspect that our society might not necessarily give us the best ideas as to how to live our lives. We find ourselves to be complicated beings with different parts, different moving parts. Uh, Freud says three, loosely speaking, categories uh, of parts, because there could be further subdivisions in Freud. Uh, Plato says th three, slightly different, but also there could be subdivisions. Again, this idea in uh, Foucault, in uh, Nietzsche, go goes back to Nietzsche, but also there, very importantly, in Buddha, Anatman, Anatman, the Buddhists would say, or Anatta in Pali. Right, this idea that uh, the self, the notion of the self, the I, is an empty tautology, and beneath this empty tautology, there are numerous forces vying for control with each other. Right, and so human beings, complex, complicated, potentially in conflict with each other, potentially in conflict with their environment, and so we need we need philosophy to think for ourselves, to think for ourselves, and to try to negotiate, to try to navigate these dangerous waters. And in, in, this, in this way, philosophy is deeply practical as a tool of self-defense, self-defense against this, uh, you know, so self-defense against internal forces that may subvert us, problems from within, troubles from within, self-defense against external forces, other people or other logics, maybe you could say narratives or memes, the word meme is uh, in vogue these days, uh, um, that are, you know, mimetic viruses, informational viruses that are trying to hijack our brains. So philosophy is, again, as an antidote, as an antivirus, as a, whatever, as a tool of self-defense. Again, Pierre Bourdieu talks about this. Uh, uh, sociology is a martial art, art of self-defense. Self-defense self against the emotions and the feelings within, which may be counterproductive. You know, struggle with, within oneself, internal struggle. And then philosophy also is a tool of self-defense against the potentially less than perfectly harmonious uh, outside world, yeah? Um, kind of, this is, this is uh, kind of one way in which philosophy is practical. And then, you know, why do we engage in this struggle? We, we, we engage in this struggle in order to be happy. That's kind of the, the, uh, the core of the philosophical enterprise, the way I see it. Philosophy being to the soul what medicine is to the body. This idea that the task of human life here on Earth is some, well, task is a strong word, uh, after the scientific revolution, after Copernicus, <laughs> Nietzsche, Freud, and Darwin. We don't believe in tasks with a capital T, right, or purposes with a capital P, or values with a capital V, right? 
but in this kind of limited fashion, what, what we are trying to do is we are trying to achieve some kind of, you know, measure of happiness. And philosophy is supposed to be helpful with that. And so when people, when students or when, you know, adults tell me that they feel that philosophy is a, a stupid enterprise, which has nothing to do with, re, with real practical life, um, I, you know, I feel that they, they have something different in mind when they say the word philosophy that, as opposed to the way I use it. You know, I would say that philosophy is supremely practical supremely practical nothing else is practical if you don't have a proper philosophy the way this is phrased right and uh, um so so it is a positive enterprise how can i become happy and hopefully how can i help you know in a, in a constructive fashion be happy and also make people around me happy be a contributing member of society I, ideally hopefully right on the one hand um and on the other hand again this this nagging doubt from Contemporary philosophers such as Nietzsche, Marx, and Foucault to the ancient philosophers such as, again, the Buddha and Socrates, this nagging doubt, this suspicion that uh, we don't necessarily always already know what is the right way to make ourselves happy and to make other pe you know, people around us happy. And uh, very importantly, uh, neither the Buddha nor Socrates, and for that matter, also uh, Nietzsche, uh, Marx and Foucault and Freud would also be would also fall into this category. So all these philosophers, critical philosophers, do not believe in the idea of evil. Like it's a big other topic I like to talk about: this teleological versus mechanistic worldview. Kind of in this teleological worldview, coming from the ancient Greek uh, telos, which means aim or purpose or goal. This in this teleological worldview, human beings are thought to have souls, and these souls are maybe good or evil, and and some people maybe are evil by nature and maybe deserve to go to hell. In, in some versions, right? And uh, from Socrates to Buddha, to Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx, and Foucault, we don't believe, we philosophers, we don't believe that there's such a thing as evil. Not that we can prove it, but we assume. This is our starting hypothesis. We don't assume that there's such a thing as evil. But we say that, you know, we live in this world, the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter. Uh, this world, unfortunately, is not our home. And so oftentimes, people do things which, which are unhelpful, which make themselves miserable and make people around them miserable. But let's not talk in judgmental terms. Let's not use the terms like shame and guilt. Sh not shame, not guilt, but, uh, you know, this kind of positive motivation, um, this, this ideal, this hope, this maybe idealistic hope, again, starting from people such as Socrates, this idea that if you examine your life critically, you can find a way um, to be a happy human being and to be a happy human being together with others. Partly because, again, Socrates and Buddha and Aristotle and all the rest of them would, uh, would say that, again, human beings are by nature social. Again, human children don't survive unless they're taken care of by their family. And again, like even if you are a critical philosopher, in order to become a critical philosopher, you need to be able to survive to, to a certain age and to be able to, to be educated. Again, you are a critical philosopher because you're part of a school of critical philosophers. Again, I talk about Foucault and Nietzsche and, and Aristotle and Buddha because there were people who wrote these ideas down and there are teachers who explained those ideas to me, right? So there's, there seems to be you know, hope. There's this hope for the pro-social element um, of human nature, right? And so, so, you know, from this uh, uh, kind of, again, philosophy as a supremely critical activity, from this negative aspect of criticizing what is wrong with society, not necessarily due to sin, not due to evil, but wrong in this, you know, small w wrong, just wrong as a, as a mistake or uh, a mistake or, or some kind of a fault, um, um, defect, not necessarily somebody's ontological sin, but just a defect in, you know, in the imperfection in this chaotic world. So from this negative, critical aspect of philosophy to the positive aspect of philosophy, uh, of, again, trying to, trying to yourself become happy and to establishing, to contributing, you know, in a productive fashion to life together with others. And this is why, incidentally, I feel that philosophy and mindfulness are so very much connected Because, again, I mentioned a moment ago, talking about Freud, how human beings are complicated, you know, in Freud and in, in Plato. Human beings are complicated. We are dominated by all, all sorts of, you know, desires and emotions. And some of them uh, more productive, some of them less productive. 
And uh, sometimes we are more reflective, more conscious of what drives us. Sometimes we are less conscious of what drives us. And, you know, it's like sometimes you, I find myself in a conversation and somebody says something and I want to respond immediately and sometimes forcefully. But then I stop myself and I think, is, is that a good thing to say? Is that a productive thing to say? So I feel that good philosophy requires this critical distance. It requires this calmness, this... Um, uh, uh, um, maybe even meditative state state of mind. And so, like, I feel to be a good philosopher, you need to learn to be calm. You need to learn to pay attention to your own feelings, um, partly because this is, this is the way in which you can learn to filter your own thoughts, filter your own ideas, and, and, you know, discern the productive ones from the counterproductive ones. Pay attention to the kinds of emotions that you have within you, right? So the Buddhists like to talk about these wholesome and unwholesome emotions. So again, like very often in a in dialogue, in a debate on some kind of philosophical issue or, or religious issue or political issue, I have this strong urge to say something and I block this urge. I sit down, I calm, calm down, maybe I meditate and I find, I understand, no, that was not a good thing to say. That was not a productive thing to say. I had the urge to say it. It might have even been pleasant in some sense to say it, but it was not the right thing to say. And now, you know, having a chance to calm down, to sit, to meditate, I come up with a different response, a much truer response, a much more productive response, a response which feels much more wholesome. Again, this imminent criterion, imminent as opposed to transcendent criterion of right and wrong. Uh, imminent in a sense like, you know, what makes us happy and Happiness is an imminent emotion. It's an imminent, something that we observe and describe from within our experience, phenomenologically. You know, there's a certain way in which we, in which we know kind of happiness. We know it when we see it, even if we cannot necessarily describe it. Um. So yeah, so I've, I've been talking about the value of mindfulness and meditation for philosophy. And further on, I want to say that, of course, in order to uh, meditate mindfully, I feel that uh, it's very often uh, necessary to also uh, be in control of one's own body, because if your body is stiff, if it's aching, it's difficult to meditate. And so some form of, uh, uh, some form of yoga is also necessary. This is kind of my way of breaking into the, to the Buddhist Eightfold Path. What we want to, you know, starting from a philosophical enterprise, what we want is clarity of thought. But in order to achieve clarity of thought, we need calmness, we need meditation, we need this concentration, dhyana, right? And it, but in order to achieve dhyana, we need we need uh, um, you know to uh, a proper relationship, harmonious relationship to our body, which leads into yoga, which ultimately leads into you know like if you want to pursue this completely, uh, this idea of right livelihood that y you need to have a. Uh, you know, be a member of a harmonious community, you know, do a job which is conducive to your well-being. Again, unfortunately, there were all sorts of things which I loved about my career as a teacher, but there were certain things which were, which were you know, conflictual, um, deleterious, counterproductive, unmindful. There were certain aspects of my job as a teacher which, which, I, which I felt pushed me away from proper mindfulness. So again, so you have this again in the, the Eightfold Path, this notion of the right livelihood, that ultimately to be a good philosopher, you need to kind of earn your living in a, in a proper fashion, uh, uh, in an appropriate mindful fashion, right? So kind of all aspects of your life ultimately have to fall into this one harmonious whole. Again, th that's, that's the hope, that's the project, that's the picture. Um, some people could say it's idealistic picture or... Uh, um, uh, overly optimistic picture, but you know this is my working hypothesis. This is the compass. This is the needle of the compass. This is where I aim to go, and I feel that the proof is in the pudding. This is what this is the thoughts I have as I set out, and then then I hope that along the way, uh, you know, the, the 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 nature of the of the enterprise, right? The kind of the way that the <laughs> this journey unfolds. Uh, will be its own reward and will be its own proof. And again, as somebody who has been teaching philosophy for more than 10 years and doing philosophy for more than 15, maybe 20 years now, right? Um, more or less, I've never once had a, had a feeling that I was doing something radically wrong, right? Uh, I feel that there was some kind of like an, an internal feeling of harmony for me uh, in this journey. And I don't know, it's like, you be the judge. I, I don't ex expect you, my dear colleague listening to this, I don't expect you to take this on faith, but um, 
listen to what I have to say. If if you do, if you do find it worthwhile, and 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 you know, see for yourself, or feel free to tell me, right? Um, that's that's also a very important part. Something I'm always tempted to talk about, kind of in this very first class. So we we lay out this project from the uh, negative and the critical to the positive and this harmonious uh, pro-social aspect of philosophy. But then a very important collegial aspect, because. Um, these, as Richard Feynman puts it, the easiest person to fool is always yourself. So when I tell these stories, how do I know that these stories are true? How do I know that I am not lying to you and not lying to myself, therefore, right? And so I feel that, again, within this philosophical enterprise, maybe associated with a, with many names, but especially with the name of John Stuart Mill, this idea, or Jürgen Habermas, this idea of a free and equal discussion, that uh, uh, in a proper philosophical classroom, we're not supposed to be teachers and students. We are supposed to be, we are supposed to be colleagues. We are supposed to be colleagues, you know, taking, taking these formal glasses off. Uh, uh, um, colleagues such that, yes, I've been engaged in this, you know, in philosophy for slightly longer than most of the students that come talk to me. But it doesn't mean, it's like I, I know certain things. I, I have bits of information at my disposal but some of this information may be useless or irrelevant. And so it's, it's up to us uh, through this dialogue again, this, where do we begin this big question? I, I like to ask of myself, one of the key starting points is this dialogue, this interpersonal dialogue, this attempt kind of, I have my own prejudice and presuppositions and axioms and my students have their axioms. And then we try to bridge this gap. We try to come to some sort of an understanding again, you know, uh, Individuality is linguistic and languages, social and society is historical. There's, there's a way in which philosophy is embedded in this social context and therefore in this dialogical context, right? But I invite my students to be my colleagues. And again, I tell them that hopefully by the end of our time together, I will have learned from them and they will have learned from me. And, you know, in this uh, kind of living, living this idea of this uh, harmonious pro-social arrangement. And when, when I talk about this, uh, Aristotelian or Hegelian or Buddhist or Marxist dream of having this enlightened society, society enlightened harmonious society. I feel that I see a certain uh, uh, proof of concept, a certain toy model of this harmonious society in a classroom, in a classroom. When the class goes well, uh, this is the kind of feeling, this is kind of an impression I have b by the end of it, right? <sighs> So I'm sure there's a million other things I wanted to say. Um, I try to talk about some of the things I don't usually come, you know, I don't usually get to. Um, I guess I could I could pause here. <laughs> one of those uh, videos I make about the value and the practical value of philosophy. Again, these thoughts brought about by some conversations I've had in recent days. Conversations about the value of philosophy and conversations... Uh, 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 which I felt could have been, could have been informed by greater philosophical appreciation uh, by the parties involved. So anyway, colleagues, um, I think I've been going on for long enough. So it's it's nice to be back. I'm really hoping I'd be able to upload this properly uh, because in this particular location the internet just doesn't work. <laughs> but but I am I am really hopeful to to resume again. This I talk about this value of the dialogue. It would be very nice, kind of. Uh, these live streams on YouTube or on other platforms. I feel this is ultimately what the internet is, is for. <laughs> this is kind of the proper function of the internet. Uh, being able to exchange ideas from people with people from all over the world. I'm extraordinarily grateful to everybody who has been uh, 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 on this journey with me together. Uh, uh, my offline students, my online students, from actually from all around the world, from, from Europe, from Asia, from South America, North America, from Africa, um, from China, from Japan, from India, you know, from Mexico, from all over the world. Um, anyway, colleagues, I hope you found this little talk uh, stimulating. Um, definitely, I hope we will continue this back and forth, this conversation, this dialogue. Uh, and until next time, colleagues, stay safe and Take care.
Namaste.